Hello there, and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. In this video, I will be talking about language acquisition, the way children learn a first language. And this topic is really important for just about any theory of linguistic knowledge. Why is that the case? Well, think about it. Kids acquire language very early in life, and they do so um, seemingly without effort. They just go ahead and do it. And so they can do very sophisticated things like use relative clauses at an age where they can't even tie their shoelaces. And that seems, well, remarkable. At any rate, it's something that linguists should be able to explain. How is it that kids can do something that's very cognitively um, challenging and, and sophisticated when they can't do other things that seem relatively trivial? Right, I want to start out by showing you a picture that you've already seen in the video on constructional morphology, video number four. And um, so here you have a man who knows how to zib. And if you ask a four-year-old or a five-year-old, okay, what's this man doing? They will tell you in no uncertain terms, he is zibbing. And uh, if you ask them, what would you call a man whose job it is to zib? They would say, zibber. What's remarkable about this is they haven't heard this word zib before and yet they can use it in these morphological constructions. So that means they have acquired something more than just strings and words that they can repeat. They have formed generalizations that allow them to use language productively and creatively. Actually, you don't even have to show uh, these, these pictures of zibbers and gutches and heaps and wogs to kids, they produce sentences that can lead you to the very same conclusion. Things like, want one other spoon, want other one spoon, daddy, or it noises, or I became to be Spider-Man, or she unlocked it open. You see that from an adult perspective, these sentences are, well, not ill-formed, but they are non-conventional. Uh, adults don't walk around saying these things. Kids do. And, um, well, when kids say these things, it's not that they are somehow um, too stupid to do the right thing. It's rather that they are cleverly understanding something about language and applying this knowledge in um, new and creative ways. So looking at this uh, example here, it noises. English has a bunch of denominal verbs from noise nouns. Yeah? It buzzes, it crashes, it splashes, it bangs. And the kid might very well realize this and think, well, if I can do this with crash and with splash, I'm going to go ahead and do this with noise and say it noises. Or uh, if you have an example of the resultative construction here, she unlocked it open. Um, well, there are examples such as she pulled it open, she cracked it open, she pried it open, and a kid who is attentive to this pattern might go ahead and say she unlocked it open. Now, you as an adult speaker, you have heard a lot of examples of the resultative construction, and you have heard unlock many, many times. And you've noticed unconsciously that unlock and the resultative construction don't overlap. So through the principle of statistical preemption, you have come to learn that she unlocked it open does not work. But the kid doesn't have this rich experience. So they go ahead and say she unlocked it open. Right. These errors, errors in scare quotes, are called overgeneralization errors. And um, they show that the child has acquired more than a string of words that is just repeated. Um, they show that the child has acquired a regularity, a schema, a rule, a construction, something of that sort. And uh, the endearing quality of these errors is that, um, well, the child has done something clever, but it has not mastered all constraints of that regularity just yet. That's What's, makes them, what's making them so cute. Okay, now, um, here's a big one. If children make overgeneralization errors, that must mean that they have acquired an abstract rule, right? Yeah, at least 
that's what you've been told in your linguistics intro class when, um, well, uh, when you were talking about the WOG test, yeah, uh, that shows that children have acquired the pluralization rule. They know how plural allomorphy works. Yeah, they have acquired a rule, evidently. Or in the example here of the resultative construction, she unlocked it open. That must mean that, okay, the kid has a rule. A subject can be combined with a verb, with an object, with a result, an adjective. Well, the question that I would like you to, to ponder for a minute or two now is, is it really evidence that the kids have acquired a rule? <clears throat> you can think about this for a while, stop the video, but I will continue now. So, on the dictionary and grammar model, that would be exactly the thing that would be assumed, okay? The kid has acquired a rule in the grammar component and can now use this rule with all the words, all the lexical items that are found in the mental dictionary. Yeah. Um, now, the construction grammar story, and you've been expecting this, I think, um, it's a little different. Um, on both models, it is assumed that kids learn generalizations. That's not the question. There's no controversy there. All current linguistic theories assume that kids learn generalizations. They might call them rules, they might call them constructions, they might call them schemas. Uh, there's no linguistic theory on earth anymore <laughs> uh, would say that, that kids only learn uh, to respond to stimuli in a behavioristic way, you know, like Pavlovian dogs responding to uh, things that the parents say. Yeah. Um, however, the models have very different hypotheses about how this process unfolds, what goes on when kids learn language. And the key difference is this. Um, the dictionary and grammar model assumes that kids acquire adult grammar and construction grammar assumes that kids start very very small with fixed items with small scale generalizations that only gradually unfold into the syntactic categories that adults have in their minds. Let me elaborate on this a little bit. Um, so we can contrast this in terms of two hypotheses. Two hypotheses. Um, the dictionary and grammar model advances something that's called the continuity hypothesis. And um, really it should be rather called the identity hypothesis because what is assumed is that kids' grammar is identical to adult grammar. Um, so kids acquire the syntactic categories and rules of adult grammar, things like subject, adjective, complement, relative clause, what have you. <clears throat> now, everybody's of course aware that kids don't talk like adults. So, if they have the right categories and rules, why don't they talk like adults? Well, if you acquire these rules one after the other, that means that at first you only have a subset of all rules, and so your language output is going to be imperfect. It's going to have um, things where you overgenerate, where you say things that adults don't really say. And it will also undergenerate, so it will leave you with a smaller repertoire of things to say than what adults walk around saying. Okay, um, let's contrast this with the story from construction grammar. And the hypothesis here is called the item-based learning hypothesis. The idea would be that kids acquire knowledge of lexical items and fixed strings of lexical items, things like more juice, more milk, more cookie, more singing, more play, and so on and so forth. Okay, and as they acquire more and more of these, they begin to see similarities across them and form generalizations. So, you realize as a child that, okay, well, the first bit of more juice, more chocolate, more singing, that's always the same. Interesting. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> Eventually, the kid arrives at a yeah, mini construction, a schema of the form more and then something. And at this point, 
the kid doesn't really know that more is something that's called a quantifier. <laughs> um, so in adult grammar it's called a quantifier and on the continuity hypothesis the idea would be the child hears something like more juice and goes okay quantifier is before the noun. You don't believe me? Well I, I have a quote and in two slides time that will clarify things. Right, um, something more on the continuity hypothesis. Just to rephrase what I just said, um, the hypothesis states that the language of children is mentally represented by the same syntactic rules and categories as adult language. And this assumption, this hypothesis, comes at a steep price. Namely, if you think that this is the case, you have to assume that there is some innate knowledge facilitating the language process, because it's really hard going from hearing a, a sound bit like more juice to going, ah, oh, okay, quantifiers before nouns. That is impossible. And so um, smart people like Steve Pinker, uh, Brian May is not Steve Pinker, but he's also a very smart man. He's a physicist, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Um, astronomer. Um, okay, so you need some innate knowledge uh, to facilitate the learning process, and that is often called universal grammar or a language acquisition device or, uh, well, Pinker has this famous book, The Language Instinct. Uh, I suggest if you haven't read it, go ahead and, and read it. Uh, it's all wrong, but it's incredibly well written and funny and you should read it. So, um, so you need some innate knowledge and certain things are hardwired into your language acquisition device and um, it's not really specified what is in there, what's in universal grammar, um, well, but it would seem that certain things, for instance, part of speech categories are really fundamental um, to get you started. Right. So here's a quote, not by Pinker, by someone else. Uh, you can look it up in the, the book. Um, once a child is able to parse an utterance, such as close the door, he will be able to infer from the fact that the verb close in English precedes its complement, the door, that all verbs in English precede their complements. Okay, so this only works if children are born with the idea that there are verbs, complements, and things like relative clauses and um, yeah, other grammatical categories. You can't get this from nothing. And so the assumption goes, well, we need something innate that helps kids learn language so they can produce relative clauses at an age where they can't tie their shoelaces. There you have it. Now, the story from construction grammar goes like this. Uh, children don't really need to infer the adult grammatical categories, but they start out by memorizing and repeating concrete words and phrases, more juice, more milk, and so on and so forth. Now, as a child recognizes similarities across different phrases, a process of schematization sets in. That's a cognitive skill that humans have, and uh, we like to see similarities across different things, even if they're not very similar. Now, this means that part of speech categories and syntactic categories and such are, are, are not fundamental. They're not things you start out with or that are hardwired into your brain. Rather, they emerge as generalizations over concrete phrases. There is something that, that comes relatively late. You start with concrete and, and, and small-scale generalizations and you get ever more abstract as you go on learning your language. Okay, so these generalizations, they get increasingly abstract until they resemble adult grammar. How do you get there? Okay, in order to do this, starting small and arriving at more abstract generalizations, you need a couple of sociocognitive skills. And uh, some of these are shared evolutionarily with um, primates and, and other smart animals. Um, others seem to be peculiar for humans. And well, here in this video, I'll talk about five sociocognitive abilities namely joint attention, intention reading, schematization, role reversal, and pattern recognition. But there are more of these. And uh, if you want the full scoop, 
I suggest that you take a look at Mike Tomasello's Constructing a Language book, um, which is already a couple years old, but it's very, very good and um, summarizes all of this in a very good, succinct fashion. So, joint attention, what's that? Um, well, words. Learning words is, is one of the, the central things that you have to master when you learn a language. And um, how do you learn them? Well, words become meaningful in situations in which both the child and the caretaker focus on an object together and they are mutually aware of this. Think of the mother playing with the baby and maybe touching the baby's foot and uh, mm, putting a sock on the baby's foot or, I don't know, doing something with the foot and the baby tickling the foot. Yeah, and, and saying foot a lot like I am now and the baby hears foot a lot and at the same time it notices that okay um, that's my mom and, and and she's looking at this part of mine um, okay at the at the end and I feel how she's doing that and I see it and I know that we're right now concentrating on the same thing yeah this bottom part of my, I don't know what it's called, they don't know the word for leg at that point, um, but they know that they and the mother are focusing on the very same thing and all the while the sound foot comes up a lot. Yeah, So that's how they can bootstrap this, um, and that's how they can make this connection between the sound foot and the, you know, nethermost part of the lower extremity of uh, their body. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so this comes around nine months of age. Before nine months of age, kids can only engage in what's called dyadic joint attention, though, so they can look you in the eye and focus on you, or they can focus on the toy and only focus on that, and they're completely lost in that. So triadic joint attention means inspecting an object together and with the ability to engage in triadic joint attention comes word learning. Yeah. So this observation that okay, uh, at nine months of age you get joint attention and then three months later around 12 months the first words start to appear in the kids language production. That's no coincidence. That's just because of that. Right. So that's something you need to acquire a language, and you all have it. Yeah, congratulations. Um, a second thing you have is intention reading. Um, young children, even very young children, interpret other people's actions as purposeful and goal-directed. This often goes under the heading of theory of mind. You have a theory of mind. You have the idea that other people too have ideas, feelings, and knowledge. I don't. I'm a solipsist. You're all figments of my imagination. Deal with it. Um, okay, so toddlers from a very early age imitate actions of others, uh, but they imitate only those that they see as successful or goal-directed, um, and not those that, they are, uh, that are accidental. Right. Um, why is this important? We'll get to this um, later. One thing that I've already talked about and that's very important is schematization. The ability to see similarities across things that are, well, similar in some way and to form abstractions. So from hearing things like all done, all wet, all dry, all hot. Um, so uh, you, you form something that's called a pivot schema, all X, or from where's daddy, where's cookie, Where's Rosie? You get where's X. From let's go and let's find it, you get let's something. And from I'm holding it, I'm pulling it, you get I'm Xing it. So, you know, the ability to say something like um, he's zibbing. Okay, pivot schemas. They're called pivot schemas because they have a pivot. That's the fixed part of the schema. And uh, the X part, that's the open slot, the variable part of the schema. And Pivot schemas are essentially the young child's grammar, a collection of pivot schemas. And um, it's not really the case that uh, the X's or the, the fixed parts correspond closely and accurately 
to adult part of speech categories. Yes, that's something you might think. Where is X? It would require some kind of nominal element. Um, yeah, I'll mention the more juice, more milk example one, one, one more time. So kids will say more juice and more milk, but also more singing, more play. And singing and play are, are not really nouns, but they are good enough for this more something pivot schema. So it's only eventually that kids arrive at these part of speech categories that um, characterize adult speech. Fourth ability is a uh, role reversal. So in linguistic interaction, in human linguistic interaction, speakers are hearers and senders at the same time. Um, and for this, you need something that um, Mark Turner and Gilles Fauconnier have called conceptual blending. Um, so the ability essentially to put yourself, put yourself into the shoes of someone else and examine what it would be like to be in the position of the other person. <clears throat> um, I've talked about this at length in the video uh, about information packaging constructions, video number five, and what you're doing is creating a model of other people's current knowledge. Now, evidently, kids are not as proficient in that as, as you and I, but they're training this. And um, <clears throat> even young children are aware that your knowledge state sometimes is not their own knowledge state, although they tend to forget about that sometimes. Right. Uh, fifth skill is pattern recognition, the ability to recognize regularities in the flow of speech. And this comes very early. This is essentially uh, the kind of language learning that goes on before the kid even utters their first word. So uh, there are neat experiments being done with uh, young infants, eight months olds. Uh, the researchers had them listen to nonce words like bidaku, paduti, bidala, tupiro, gubida, and so on and so forth. And um, there was a regularity hidden in those items, namely the syllable B was always followed by da. And then in the second stage of the experiment, the, the kids were exposed to new words, two types. Uh, one type that was in line with the phonotactics that were present in the stimuli, the earlier stimuli, the training stimuli, and words that were different in their phonotactics from previous words. And guess what? Infants showed greater interest towards these new and um, unusual words that violated some established patterns, some expectations. So the baby's brain was, you know, <clears throat> accommodated, um, got accustomed to this idea that B was always followed by Da. And then suddenly you have a word Da Biko uh, and your brain is pissed off because, wait, there goes my generalization. Shoot. Um, so that's how the, the kids showed greater interest towards these pattern recognition. Fully automatic and, and humans do this. They're, they're fantastic pattern recognition machines. Right, so there you have it. Five sociocognitive abilities. There are more. But these to me seem very, very fundamental and, and really important in order to get language off the ground. Right. Um, now, <clears throat> um, in the following, in the rest of this video, I uh, want to present to you three studies of early language learning, and um, all of them have to do with these pivot schemas. Um, and generalizing across pivot schema seems to be one central task in learning a language. Um, this works okay with English nouns. So if a child learns something like noodles in there, um, or my noodles, noodles hot, they realize, okay, this noodles thing that appears across different strings that I hear. And um, so if the child masters things like um, X in there or my X or X hot, uh, they will be able to transfer one element from an open slot in the X in there pivot schema to another pivot schema, my X. 
With verbal pivot schemas, that's a lot more difficult. So um, if you introduce kids to a new verb, meeking, and um, <clears throat> ask kids to reproduce that, two-year-olds are really hesitant to do that, even though they may have pivot schemas with ink forms, like I'm holding it or I'm pulling it. They don't feel comfortable extending a verb to other pivot schemas. And um, well, why is this? Um, Mike Tomasello has proposed something that is called the verb island hypothesis. Um, and this has nothing to do with island constraints. Uh, that's just another island metaphor. Islands are such a good source domain. It means that verbs in early language acquisition form islands of grammatical organization, so that each verb is limited to ideally just one syntactic pattern. Um, so tickle in the proto-transitive pivot schema, you might say. Tickle me, tickle it, tickle doggy. Put in a uh, proto-caused motion kind of schema. Put it there, put it up, put it down. And uh, swinging in a proto-intransitive schema. Eye swinging, baby swinging. Now adults are more um, proficient with verbs. They use verbs in several syntactic patterns and English is notorious for this. Yeah? Stop tickling, John was tickled by Mary, John tickled me silly, John tickled Mary out of the room. Um, there are many, many patterns with a simple verb like tickle. Okay, um, now in the previous videos I was always very, very uh, pedantic about saying, well, what's what's the evidence? What evidence is there for this? Um, and, um, well, having proposed this item-based learning hypothesis, I think I owe you an explanation. What evidence is there for item-based learning? And that's what we'll turn to now. Here's the first of three uh, studies that I will discuss in the rest of this video. First, boils down to the observation that kids are conservative about verbal pivot schemas. The idea that I just introduced. And um, Brooks and Tomasello made this point through a study of the English passive. Now the passive is a relative latecomer in kids' speech and there could be different reasons for that. It could be that the passive is <clears throat> very complex, complex construction, and so kids find it too hard. Or it could be that the passive is too infrequently used and so kids don't see the necessity to bother with it. Okay, to address this question, uh, Brooks and Timosello asked the following, can we train young children to use the passive? And if they can, that it would be likely that input frequency, not overall complexity, explains the early absence of passives. Second, uh, can the children then use the passive productively? In other words, if we teach them the passive and then we give them a new transitive verb, do they realize that this transitive verb, the new one, can be passivized and also be used in the passive construction. Okay, so they took two sets of children, uh, one around two and a half years, one around 3.5 years, and they introduced both groups to new verbs, namely meeking and tamming. In case you don't know what meeking and tamming signify, well, this is meeking. Yeah, wanna see it again? Oh, the fraggle was meeking the banana. Um, tamming, <laughs> R2 was, R2 has tamed the banana. Lots of tamming going on. Yeah, um, so meeking and tamming. And uh, the kids were divided into two groups, an active training group and a passive training group. So this experiment took place in a preschool-like setting, a lab, where there were lots of toys and the kids were uh, asked into the lab and the experimenter played with them in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And if you belonged to the active training group, um, the experimenter would go ahead and then do a lot of meeking and then tamping um, <laughs> with the toys there. And they would say things like, look, the fraggle is meeking the banana, or wow, the robot just tamped the banana. Who's meeking the banana? Can you, can, can you tell who's making the banana? Did you see who just tamed the banana? And so on and so forth for half an hour. Um, the passive training group, 
heard sentences like, hey, the banana got meek by the fraggle. See how the banana got tamed by the robot? What's going to get meek now? I think something is getting meek again. You get it. Okay. Now, the interesting bit happened after that half an hour, um, where the kids were presented with the, okay, now now it's your turn, you know, do some meeking, tamming. Um, and the, the child went ahead and, and tammed the banana. And then the experimenter would ask a question, namely, oh, what happened? In a neutral kind of way. Or sometimes they would ask, oh, what happened to the banana? And you see that that is a patient-focused question. And if you ask an adult, what happened to the banana? Um, notice that the adult would use a passive construction here. Oh, the banana got meeked by the fraggle. In an agent-focused question, by contrast, what did the fraggle do? Uh, nobody would really say um, the banana was meeked by the fraggle. Right? An agent-focused question prompts you to use an active construction. A patient-focused question prompts you to use a passive. And um, the purpose of this asking, of course, was can children adjust their use of novel verbs to the discourse needs of their interlocutor. So, I've been trained in the passive, but then I get an agent-focused question. Do I have the skill to use this verb that I've only heard in the passive in the active, or vice versa? That's the question. Okay. Um, whoops. Okay, here we are. Um, what came out? Well, you can sort of guess it. Um, here we have a graph with the results, and you see uh, there are bars for the uh, young passive trained children, old passive trained children, young active trained, and old active trained. And on the y-axis we have the percentage of children who responded to the questions with a passive voice construction. Okay, um, if you squint and look at this, well, who used a passive the kids that were trained in the passive. They used lots of passives. Um, and um, the kids who were trained in the active, very, very few passives. Okay, so if you heard a verb in the active and only in the active, and afterwards you are reluctant to transfer that verb into the passive. But there's more. You see that within each group, the three bars are not at the same height. So there's a main effect of question type. When kids got asked an agent-focused question, what did the fraggle do? They were less likely to use a passive construction. Yeah. So even in the passive trained group, roughly 40% of them used the active. Now, only 40%, but um, that's a lot less than um, when they got the passive question. Right, and, and lastly, um, you see that this effect of question type is mainly carried by the passive trained group. In the active trained group, it's more or less the same all the time. Uh, hardly any passive responses. But in the young and old passive trained children, there is a sizable difference between the agent-focused question and the patient-focused question. So question type makes a large difference in the passive trained group, only a small difference in the active trained group. This is called an interaction effect. Um, you can look up interaction effect on Wikipedia. Right. <clears throat> what does this show? This shows that two things. Two things. Um, kids are conservative in transferring a verb across different pivot schemas that they have. And second, it's easier to transfer from the passive to the active than it is to transfer from the active to the passive. Okay, when you've heard a verb in the active, you have little trust in the idea that, okay, I might also passivize this thing. Um, but if you heard something in the passive, there you are quite confident that, okay, I can also use this in the active construction. Um, why is that? Well, it's because probably even these young children have the idea that the active construction is something that's very productive, that um, takes in lots and lots of verbs, has a high type frequency, a high uh, productivity. Yeah. Um, 
to round this off, no effect of age. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Um, so young children did this just as the old children. So it can't be that the passive is somehow too complex or uh, too difficult for children at this age, two and a half. Second study, um, a big argument that you will have encountered is the argument that uh, yeah, um, kids say things that they've never heard before. So that's evidence for the rule-based nature of language. Um, yeah, kids acquire rules and once they have the rule, boom, they say tons and tons of new things. The fact of the matter is that children's linguistic creativity has been grossly overestimated and I'd like to show this study to you. Um, now, of course, also uh, construction grammar would uh, assume that, okay, there's creativity in language use and it emerges after a while. But um, in a construction grammar usage-based model, the assumption would be that there is low initial creativity and then there is suddenly a, gra that there's a gradient increase over the lifespan. Um, <clears throat> with a dictionary and grammar model, it would be sudden, yeah? So initially low, then the kid has acquired the rule, and then suddenly there is an increase in new in creative language use. So evidence that a rule has been acquired and is freely applied after that. Right. Um, now, on the dictionary and grammar continuity hypothesis, also there, kids would start with lexically fixed phrases, but then they would acquire an adult syntactic rule, and that would allow them to productively apply that rule with all the lexical material that they have, so that you see a boost a sudden shoot of um, creative usage. On the item-based learning hypothesis, you would start with lexically fixed phrases, then vary individual items, and ever so slowly arrive at a broader generalization. But this is very much an incremental process, not a um, sudden development. Okay, how can these hypotheses be tested? How can they be assessed? <clears throat> Okay, um, the evidence that we have is that a high percentage of everything a kid says um, either has been said before or has been heard before. Um, so, if we want to assess the creativity of a new utterance, we can try to link that utterance to earlier things that the kid has said through processes such as change, uh, substitution, add-on, drop, insertion, or rearrangement. If the child says something like, I got the butter, yeah, we can sort of relate that utterance to something the kid has heard before, um, I got the door. Or if a child has said, uh, let's move it around, and that is new, well, we could link it to something like, let's move it, that the child has said before. Um, now, if we take, say, um, the sum total of what a child says in a 24-hour span and uh, catalog all these utterances and try to relate them to earlier utterances in terms of how many steps of change are necessary for each utterance, uh, then we would have a fairly reliable measure of how creative um, a child's speech is. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Elena Levin and uh, Eva Dabrowska were interested in this, and so they did a case study with two children and recorded uh, these children for six weeks at age two and then again for six weeks at age three. So they got away with four really high density corpora and then they divided those corpora into a main part, 80%, and then a test part. Uh, I don't know if it's really 80, 20 or, or something other than it looks more like uh, 10 to one, something along those lines. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> how creative? Our young children. It turns out that about 60% of what kids said in the test corpora yeah, um, had already occurred in the main corpora. Of course there were creative 
uh, utterances in the test corpus. Um, but <clears throat> the biggest chunk of those required only one small change from the target to a predecessor. And uh, the things that required two or more really account just for something like 10% of the entire database. So most of the things that kids say they have either heard before or they have said them before. And um, <clears throat> the stuff that is really and truly original is very, very rare. <clears throat> um, they also went one step further then and looked at the very, very creative parts of the, uh, the, the database, the um, utterances that they could not relate to something earlier that the child had said. And um, it turns out that most of these were actually not creative applications of rules, but rather they were grammatically deviant uh, sentences, uh, sentences that don't really work from an adult perspective. Either because there is an inappropriate filler, uh, do you want to football? or an inappropriate add-on, which ones go by here, or a constituent omission, uh, and what that done. So what this means is when the child says something original, it's not because they have learned a rule, it's because they are overly confident in playing around the things that they already know. Okay, So it's not at all what the dictionary and grammar model would predict. Right, so a high proportion of the problematic utterance are ill-formed by adult standards. This means when children use language creatively, they go beyond what they know, they try things out, rather than applying abstract rules to create novel utterances. Right, I find this hilarious in some way. Conclusions. Um, the creativity of later child speech has been grossly overestimated. Small variations account for the lion's share of everything that kids say. Uh, this makes them no less adorable, no less clever, no less cute. Yeah, uh, It's just a thing to acknowledge. Um, the variation that does exist does not point to the application of rules. It points to pivot schemas and playing around with pivot schemas. Yeah. Um, so this means item-based learning seems to continue as the main process of language acquisition. It's not abandoned in favor of a learning uh, principle. Uh, approach. <clears throat> Third study. Um, the collocational properties of constructions facilitate acquisition. What do I mean by that? Um, so, kids must learn that there are these four meaning correspondences that I've been talking and talking about. Um, John emailed me the report. Um, <clears throat> the ditransitive construction here. You know that John caused me to receive the report by means of emailing it. Um, so, learners must be able to interpret novel utterances. <clears throat> With regard to words, kids are notorious for being great learners. They have something that's called fast mapping. That is, you tell them the name of a thing once and they memorize it just like that. Yeah? They learn lexical items at a stunning rate. Mm. Okay, um, the question is, is this also possible with syntactic constructions? Kids can do this with words, but can they also do it with syntactic constructions? Um, and um, Adele Goldberg and her collaborators had an idea, namely, learning a construction might be easy if a syntactic structure often occurs with one particular lexical element. Okay, if there's one prototypical lexical element that often occurs in a construction, that could act as, I don't know, maybe something around which this knowledge of the construction can crystallize. Um, indeed, many constructions have a most frequent verb. So the <clears throat> um, okay, say a construction like the intransitive motion uh, construction. This goes there. Yeah, a subject, a verb, and a locative. Um, in 40% of all cases, mothers use the verb go when they talk to kids. This goes in there, or this goes on the top shelf. Um, 
<clears throat> in instances of the uh, cause motion construction, yeah, subject verbs, object, oblique, a good yeah, uh, 80, uh, 38 percent works with put, and then the ditransitive construction, well, 20 percent give that may not be that outstanding, but still 20 percent that's enough to work as a prototype, I would say. Right. Um, <clears throat> Goldberg and her colleagues then devised an experiment in which they taught uh, kids a new English phrasal pattern with a new meaning, namely noun phrase one, noun phrase two, and then a verb. And the meaning of that was something appears. Yeah? So a sentence like the frog, the sock, mupoed would mean something like the frog appeared from under the sock or in the sock or somewhere you know, close to the sock. And um, this was also done with, with children, and the participating children heard sentences and simultaneously watched video sequences in which an animal or toy spontaneously appeared. Um, I'll show you the training or something along those lines very shortly. And then the task was uh, participants were given one sentence to judge. They, they had to choose between two possible video clips to match the sentence with a video clip. Let me show you how this works. So here that's a training unit and the kids heard, hmm, the frog, the sock, mupoed. Oh, wait, 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 I need to make this large. Um, here we go. The frog, the sock, mupoed. Hmm, okay. Now, this is a critical trial. So here the child would have to decide um, which video corresponds to the cow, the hat, mupo. I'll play this. Ah, there we are. The cow, the hat, mupo. And you realize it is um, well, the left one. <clears throat> right. Now, <clears throat> the training groups were a little different. Again, uh, there were different conditions. Uh, the procedure was that subjects saw eight clips with these stimuli, uh, a rabbit appearing on a hat, a monster wiggling out from under a cloth, a frog dropping down into a box, and so on and so forth. And uh, they heard sentences like, the rabbit, the hat, mupoed, or the monster, the cloth, keyboard. What were the different conditions? Um, the children were put into three different groups. One group that was called the skewed frequency group. Um, and why was this a skewed frequency group? Well, the uh, verb mupo was more frequently heard in this group, four times, one times veiko, once uh, suto, once kibo, and one fego. And in the balanced frequency group, you had twice uh, mupo and veiko and suto and uh, kibo and fego just once. The control group had no sound whatsoever. So, question, does it make a difference if you're in the skewed frequency group? Does the skewed frequency maybe facilitate the task because you have this prototype with the four instances? Turns out that yes, you do have an advantage. Uh, so the control group did not perform better than chance. Yeah? So uh, there were six trials and the control group got exactly three right. Yeah, chance level. Uh, the balanced group did a little better, significantly better though, and the skewed group did better still. So they're not quite at six, but they're better than the balanced group. Um, yeah, what this means is that hmm, maybe this is a design feature of language. Maybe this is a design feature that constructions have most frequent lexical elements and um, they are useful because there you can associate the form and the meaning on the basis of that lexical element because kids are very good at memorizing and learning these lexical elements. I'm summing up. Um, what's the evidence for item-based learning? Well, kids extend verbal pivot schemas very conservatively. It doesn't look like they're applying rules that allow them to um, say productive things, um, say things productively, rather. Um, second, children's linguistic creativity has been overestimated. <clears throat> uh, 
And thirdly, skewed frequencies of constructional collocates uh, facilitate the learning of construction. I think that's it for today. Um, the next time I will be talking about language change and language variation, and that will already be the last video of the sequence. So I hope you will watch that as well. Thank you.